Uh, this is the final um, talk of track two, the developer track here at Tech Exeter. And next up, we've got Joseph Woodward from Justeat. <coughs> and uh, Joseph is a .NET focused software engineer currently working at Just Eat in Bristol, a regular speaker at our youth groups, um, an active member within the .NET community, OSS contributor, organizer of the .NET Southwest meetup, and co-organizer co of the DDD Southwest conference. So, Joseph. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the talk. Um, lots of good talks today. I'm glad you chose mine at the end. Um, today we're going to talk about going to us with AWS. Um, but before that, um, anybody out there, if uh, speaking is a, is, a, is a great hobby to get into, anybody out there that's interested in speaking, I highly recommend it. Um, you, know, you look into, I'm just a developer here to share my experiences with, with AWS. So you can a great opportunity to learn. So if you have knowledge of always small meetups like the TechX meetup here, we do small lightning talks. So if it's something you're interested in, I'll definitely, definitely recommend pursuing it. So, a bit about me. We've got a few more. Um, a bit about me. Uh, yeah, so it was the introduction. I'm Joe Woodward, .NET developer, currently working at Just Eat, where we've got a lot of servers. Um, we get an awful lot of traffic there, so Lambda is something we've been heavily investing in recently. Um, so a lot of this experience is gained from there. Uh, I'm quite active online, I enjoy blogging, um, quite, quite chatty as well, so feel free to talk to me afterwards, any questions, um, or hit me up on any of the, the, the channels here. Um, so the agenda is what we're going to look at today. Um, I'm going to my time, actually. <laughs> So we'll start off with what is serverless, the definition of serverless. There's a lot of ambiguity around the name, you know, what it means. Um, where serverless fits into an architecture, you don't have to go full steam ahead with serverless. You can actually start to introduce it slowly into your, your architecture. The characteristics of serverless as well. Um, and then also we'll look at some, some architectural examples and stuff. You keep on popping out. Yeah, do you want to try the other mic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, can, I can always take the mic off. Yeah. Can I remember? Are they using the mics to record? Yeah. The audio, okay. But we need to record as well, so... Uh, if, I mean, can everybody hear, hear me at the back? Yes. Yeah. 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 Stay at this volume anyway, so if I, I do start to go quiet, then yeah, just throw something at me. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, architectural examples, vendors as well, some of the vendors out there that, that supply serverless, um, and also some of the, the frameworks available, which, you know, which really sort of which really help uh, in the service world, and we'll jump into some code at the end. Um, so, when coming up with this talk, going serverless with AWS Lambda, um, anybody that spends any time looking into serverless, um, they'll, they'll, they'll very quickly um, come to the, the, the acknowledgement that it's the, the term serverless itself, um, there's a lot of ambiguity in the name, a lot of people have different opinions as to whether it's a good name for the, the technology or a bad name. Um, there's even a, a, a conference out there, they got, the organisers got fed up with the concept of serverless and the word serverless being thrown around. They, they, their whole idea was, well actually, you know, it, it's just merely a name that describes a type of architecture, you could call it anything. And as a result, they, they called their, their conference the Jeff Conference, um, <laughs> even though it's serverless focus. I don't know why that's, that's harmed them in, the, in, you know, in, sort of, in, a, in Google and search rankings, so they started using that term, but there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of mixed feelings around, around the term, so a better way to describe it is functions as a service, but when you come up with a talk, you know, you're proposing the talk to a conference, go on functions as a service with AWS Lambda, it's a bit lame, so service. <laughs> um, so what is serverless? Uh, the name, as I said, suggests is quite ambiguous. One of the best definitions I like to refer to is uh, this, this one by Mike Roberts on martinfowler.com. Anybody that hasn't heard of Martin Fowler, he's quite a prolific um, software engineer kind of he brought refactor into the limelight, um, and this is a sort of a guest post by one of the people he works with. Um, and the definition they use there is to say service architectures refer to applications that significantly depend on third party services, known as back end as a service, which we'll look at shortly, or on custom code that's run in ephemeral containers, functions as a service. So, this is an interesting quote. Um, if we break this down, we'll go through it a bit by bit. So, service architecture refers to applications that significantly depend on third party services, known as BAS, back ends of service. So, when we start to look at back end of the service and what it is, it actually differs slightly from the other side. The, the, so, the, it's a type of service, but there are two different types of service approaches. 
So in the same post, it goes on to say that IaaS, infrastructure as a service, and PaaS, which is platform as a service, two different um, types of, of providers. Azure is, is more platform as a service, AWS is more infrastructure as a service. Uh, but based on the premise that server and operating system management can be commoditized. Uh, service, back end as a service, on the other hand, is a result of an entire application components being commoditized. So that's why you take things like authorization, um, and instead of having to build your own, if you're using .NET, you're using like identity server or building your own OAuth implementation, you can use, you go to OAuth.com, you can actually use their, 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 their service and depend on that instead of you having to build that out yourself. So essentially you're offering that whole back end that you'd have to develop to another company that manages it for you. And then the rest. Um, custom code that runs in ephemeral containers functions as a service. This is what we're going to be focused on most of the, this talk. Um, is functions of a, a service. But the, uh, the ephemeral contains is an important one to bear in mind early on in the talk, because generally with these, these, this service technology, is this code is run inside of a Docker container. And any of you that haven't heard of Docker um, or the containerization movement, it's essentially a platform where you can, um, you can wrap your code in an image and it keeps the, the runtime environment the same. You can deploy that image to uh, a machine with the Docker host running on it, and it will run that image as a virtual machine, essentially. Um, and that's exactly how serverless code executes. It executes in the context of a container that can be spun up really quickly and torn down afterwards. So you have to bear in mind they're short-lived containers. So the characteristics of serverless. <clears throat> if we were to define serverless, see, there's a lot of mixed feelings around the definition, but these are generally sort of the, the general theme throughout every definition you'll see. Um, so as the name suggests, there are no servers to worry about. Um, this is a lie. There are actually servers. You just don't have to worry about them. The name "servers" comes from the fact that, you're, as far as you're concerned, there are no servers. You know, your, your processor has to run somewhere and does run on servers, and that's kind of where that, that mixed feelings about the definition comes from. Um, the benefits of forgetting about the servers is you start to reduce um, operational costs around the outside of the code as well. You have a lot of stuff that goes on around the side of your deployed application, like your caching, your server maintenance, security patches, things like that. And that's all taken care of for you by your, by your provider. Um, things like scaling as well is also taken care of when it comes to serverless, um, and deployments as well, and security, all, all things managed by your provider of choice. <coughs> Next one is um, on-demand execution. Um, the whole premise of serverless is you deploy your code, it remains in an idle state. Um, as soon as it doesn't even remain in an idle state at that point, it's actually just it's not even running. So you deploy your code to, um, say, AWS in this instance, and it's not running. As soon as uh, you get a request, then you have the, your, your method is invoked, and it will spin up a container. There's a slight warm-up uh, warm um Fee you have to pay where you have to wait a few seconds for the container to turn up, but after that it will remain in memory and active for about five minutes. It'll handle the request, and after five minutes of inactivity, it will then shut down and you'll lose that state. So it's all very on demand. If you have peaky traffic, it's perfect for things like that where you don't have as consistent loads. Um, so the benefit of this is you only pay for when your code runs. So if you have a microservice, for instance, that is hit on occasion. Um, then you don't have to pay for an EC2 instance. Um, when I use the term EC2, anybody that isn't familiar with AWS, EC2 is their, their, it's essentially a virtual machine that you can, you can SSH into or you can log into and manage yourself. And that is what an EC2 instance is. So you only have to pay for when your code runs. For a microservice, which is only hit from time to time, um, you, can, you can take that initial warm up because of the way the type of service it is. Then you only pay when your method is invoked. And these, this, this service component is just a method as well as a single handler, which we'll go through soon, um, which invokes your code. Because of this as well, um, it can scale elastically. So it scales horizontally. AWS take care of all of that. You don't have to revision new EC2 instances. It will just, as it gets more load and starts to read feet, it will start to then increase the number of lambdas that are, are running. Um, as I said, they live up to about five minutes in total. That will, that will vary depending on the, the service and the provider you're, you're, you're using. Um, I'm quite familiar with AWS, where it's up to five minutes, but I'm, I don't know whether um, Azure is any different or Google Cloud Platform. But they do have a certain, certain lifetime. They'll remain in memory once they take that first hit and then eventually get shut down. Um, as I mentioned, 
They're great for things like inconsistent traffic patterns, as we can see here. This this red this red one here is an EC2 instance where it would be running at a, a constant load. You pay for that box, you, you know, you, you keep it going, you get charged for for the run of the box with a uh, with a, a, a serverless API or a service component. If you've got Peaky load where it's very inconsistent, you can't predict it, then they're ideal for those kind of those kind of components. Um, at Just Eat, where we work, we have very predictable loads, so we know that it starts to get busy about between five o'clock to nine o'clock. So we start to we have a timer that will ramp up the number of EC2 instances we've got. Um, and then it will ramp them back down and we'll go to sort of three quarters of the number there. So in those instances for a lot of the services we use at Just Eat, EC2 instances. Um, do the job for us, but there can be some components or APIs where you know um, serverless is a better fit. Stateless. So stateless is uh, important. You're used to dealing with state in applications or in, in web services. Um, containers, because they spin up on the, the first hit, they remain active for five minutes and then get shut back down. You do lose that state, so you can't depend on any any sort of state being stored within the within the container. Um, when it comes to managing state, you have to start looking and thinking about outside of the container. So you, you need to start thinking about um, out of process caches, things like that, or databases even. So, um, you know, Redis, AWS provide um, Elastic Cache, which is essentially a sort of memcache or Redis, and storing state in there. Um, and of course, that then comes with a sacrifice because you're adding sort of complexity to your, to your system and you're adding additional requests to an outside service versus something in memory where it's immediately accessible. If you're using Redis, so, you know, it's pretty fast as it is. Um, but yeah, it's something worth considering. <clears throat> the next one is um, event-based. So serverless, uh, the, the idea behind serverless is all very event-focused. But what I mean by event-based is events such as HTTP requests, database events, um, any kind of file storage changes, notifications and messages. So, when you log into the AWS console and you start trying to create a, uh, a container, you can start to choose the type of event you want to invoke these, um, these, these serverless components. So for instance, API Gateway um, is um, essentially just, uh, you can define your API um, interface and then you can channel those API calls to whatever um, backend system you want. So it's, where kind of, it's a facade over your backend system essentially. And you can use those to invoke Lambda functions. Um, CloudWatch events and CloudWatch logs. Uh, when you start reading through some of these, you start getting ideas as to how you potentially use this stuff. So with CloudWatch events, you could have if um, an event is raised from a, a, a microservice, for instance, you can have a certain event raised in the in the logs, or logs is probably a better example. If you see a certain log entry, you can then cause um, Lambda functions to invoke and get called based on those log entries as well. So you start becoming quite reactive to you know, what's happening in, in other services. Um, DynamoDB, another one to point out, that's their, their sort of document DB or, or document database approach. You can, things like um, saving new documents to, to a store, you can then have that process and that event invoke a function. Um, so if you are, for instance, saving uh, an email address and you wanted to send a confirmation email, you can have right into the database invoke a function sending over that, that payload, that event, where you can then take that email address and then use a provider like um, campaign monitor and email provider to then send a, an email to, to that user. Um, and then SNS is more sort of notifications and queues when you can start to sort of pipe messages to, to other components. So serverless is architectural styles. There's different types of, um, of servers you can start to deploy um, in, in your, your infrastructure. Um, the first one, which is probably the easiest to get into, is um, serverless as glue. And what that means is, um, say for instance you had a web application and you would take a, an image, a user would upload an image as we see here, it then goes into an S3 bucket, which is, is sort of storage, is, is block storage in the, the AWS world. Even all these, these really weird abstract icons, it's one of the issues I have with AWS, their icons are just so abstract and meaningless. Like, even I've been using AWS now for years and I still haven't figured out what they are. 
And so I figured I'd put the definitions underneath. So you upload uh, an image from your web application, profile image, for instance, it has to be a certain size. It goes into blob storage. You can raise the event, you can call your, your S3 bucket to call and invoke a, uh, an AWS Lambda, um, sending that image over where it can find that image, which can then process that image. It's got to go through an API gateway, uh, which, as I mentioned a moment ago, is it kind of allows you to, to point a HTTP endpoint to a, a, um, a Lambda. Um, and then that Lambda can reprocess those images Resize those images, save them into another bucket location. So you can start to sort of, if you, you take a moment to think about your existing um, infrastructure and applications at work, you can start to find these small little areas where you can actually offload that and turn that into a second service. And this is a prime example as to where you'd find those, those, those sort of little um, sort of nooks in your application where they don't need to be always running. If you were running a large infrastructure, you would have to say microservice for managing that kind of stuff. You can remove that, just place that, and replace that with the Lambda, which you only pay on the location. It's really, really cheap. Um, and it can just have that single focus on resizing images and then putting them back in the bucket, and then three bucket for use later. Another example is email as a service. Going back to the, the email we, we spoke about a moment ago. So your web server takes a request, Persists, say, a, a profile and a new user created to Dynamo Document Database. Uh, Dynamo Document Database then can recognize that that event has been raised to persist some, some data storage. And then it can invoke the AWS Lambda, which can then call the um, Campaign Monitor API, ultimately sending an email to, to the user that made that initial request to ask them to confirm their email address, for instance. Again, if this were wrapped up in, you know, in, in, a, in a service uh, in your AWS Lambda, you could you could start to use that as like a mail service. Again, it's one of those things that you don't want to provision a whole new machine, sit there wasting money whilst it's you know idly doing nothing. Um, it's one of those instances where you can deal with a, a fifteen second warm up time on a on a Lambda. Um, so there are kind of domains like that where you start to see that as quite a, a good fit for that that kind of technology on things that you know don't have to that, that sort of have that eventually consistent fashion of you know, waiting a few seconds before um, before it's called. Users are generally quite happy to wait you know, a few minutes for emails to come through. Um, if like like we are at Just Eat, you work in a sort of a, a microservices architecture. Um, then they're a great fit in there. There are certain domains that, that Lambda sort of work quite well. Um, if it's, I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head, but if you've got this, this, this sort of rather small domain that doesn't quite fit in its own EC2 instance, again, it fits within the constraints um, I mentioned about um, Lambda, such as the initial startup time. Um, then in this instance, we've got a, a HP request hit a, hitting a load balance. So go into one of the, you know, a, a, a virtual machine um, in your, your cluster. Um, they then sort of pipe that, that event off to API Gateway, which calls your, your microservice. So there are some times where you need to build a new service. It doesn't really fit in the, the sort of the, the domain of some of these, these aggregates. And you think, well, actually, that could just be a small microservice in itself. If it grows over time and becomes bigger, um, then you know you can always you can always do that. But it's great for those kind of edge cases as well. And then at the same time, one of the great things about Lambda's um, still relatively new technology is people are beginning to build actual web applications into um, Lambdas. So um, being a .NET developer, um, they've done a whole lot of work recently on initial warm-up times and startup times of .NET code. Um, so you can actually host a whole web page or API inside of a Lambda. And again, as long as you're happy to, to take that initial warm-up hit, then you can host a web application or a website in Lambda as well. Um, and then periodically ping it to keep the, the box alive because you only pay per function invocation. Um, you can set up a CloudWatch event on a timer, say every four to five minutes, to just ping your, your application um, via another Lambda. So you have a Lambda to ping your application every four or five minutes on this, um, this CloudWatch event, keeping your, your website alive. Again, if you've got a website, a blog, that you don't get huge amounts of traffic to, then you know, it's, a, it's a great a great way to sort of save some costs there instead of paying for a, a VM. And there are frameworks out there that are kind of enabling actually bundling in, bundling websites into to Lambdas. And the same with APIs, any type of API that fits that model as well. 
Um, so serverless architecture um, as backend of a, as a service, we touched on this earlier. Um, one of the canonical examples of these guys, Cloud Guru. Um, anybody here heard of Cloud Guru before? Yeah, a few hands, okay, yeah. So Cloud, Cloud Guru, um, they're sort of all in on, on AWS. They offer some really, really fantastic um, tutorials and videos on just getting, um, getting um, certified as a, in, in AWS. And their whole entire infrastructure is all um, AWS standard. They don't have one single VM running. Um, and they're, they're quite well known for this, this sort of famous line, I'm going to say, with 40,000 users across 100 countries interacting in real time. We don't run a single server. Um, and they've been going around the world sort of talking about this architecture. But they have managed to sort of completely run their whole entire business inside of Lambda's call and Lambda's call, calling other services. And they, um, you know, they've been very successful with that. As an architectural approach, it doesn't necessarily fit everybody, the whole sort of back end as a service approach. Um, but it, it's there as an option for those businesses and those business models where, you know, where, where it, it can fit. Um, to give an idea on their infrastructure, there's this whole, with back end of services, this whole concept of having a heavy client. So if you're, say, uh, an Array or, or Angular developer, um, what you can actually do is you can bundle a lot of the business logic in your client side again. If if the type of application or service you're building permits that. Um, and then you can start to use all these external services, these back-end services like OAuth, where you can rely on an external service to take care of authentication. Um, you can then start to high request off to S3. Firebase, which is a, um, a database provided by an external company or like their relational database management where they take care of managing all the databases, again, meaning you don't have to run and manage a single box, saving on all those costs of time and effort of keeping them up to date. Um, but again, it, you know, it's, very, it's very particular to the type of business you're running. Uh, but if you are building a mobile app or something, um, then that's, that's an option there for you is to just call the mappers directly. <coughs> Um, there's this great article I'd, I'd probably recommend. It's worth checking out by them, where they talk about the, the whole sort of the whole approach to building out the cloud guru as a platform. Um, they've got some, lots, lots of useful information where I've got some of these pictures from. So naturally, with anything in technology, um, as us developers know, everything comes with an advantage and a disadvantage. A lot of, of what we do as developers, you know, we all know there's sort of compromises involved. You know, do you go with that technology? What disadvantages that have over? Over another, um, and, and, and Lambda is certainly no different in that regard. So, one of the advantages, well, many of the advantages of, of, sort of serverless as a technology is the reduced operational costs. We've already talked about there's no VM to manage, so you don't have to worry about keeping it up to date, security patches, things like that, and all the operational costs go with that. Um, you've also got reduced development costs and time to market, hopefully in a moment. Um, we're doing a lot of time, so I'll, I'll show you how easy it is to set up a Lambda, modify a Lambda, push it up to AWS and provision everything you need. Um, it's extremely fast. You get a very fast feedback cycle in developing. Um, as well, because you're cutting out all the craft uh, we, we talked about earlier, such as... Um, i to think back on the slide now. Um, we had the... The... I'm not going to go all the way back. But it's all around managing the service. We're cutting a lot of that out, so it means that we spend more time developing. And as a developer, I don't know about you, but when I got into development, you know, it was all about programming. All I wanted to do was go to work and program. I didn't want to care about all the, you know, the BS that goes on outside of it. Even though these days I find DevOps and things like that quite interesting. Like when you're building out lambdas, you do get that fast sort of nature of programming, push it up, see your changes very, very rapid. Scaling on demand, as I mentioned, um, great for unpredictable spikes. Um, there are a few businesses out there, sort of social networks that, that use Lambda quite heavily. Um, one of them, a company called Ubel, um, and, and their sort of lead architecture, um, there has some great videos on, on AWS Lambdas, but they, they were using them quite successfully there because they had people in their social network and tweeting something, all of a sudden there'd be this massive rush of users and they couldn't provision instances in time. They couldn't say, okay, well, we need to now spin up some EC2 instances because the amount of time it takes for AWS to provision a new Linux instance and then put your image on top of it, mm -hmm. add that into your load balancer, and also the, the, the startup time, by the time that's over, people, your servers are either swamped or people are just fed up of hanging, sort of waiting for new servers to be, um, be created. So it's perfect for those, those unpredictable spikes. 
Uh, but it's often quite cheap as well. It, we'll sort of look at the, the cost side shortly, but it can be incredibly cheap, but at the same time, um, as we'll go through the disadvantages, it does sometimes come at cost as well. So again, it all depends on the business model, the type of application you're, you're building, but we'll go through that in a second. Um, and then the faster feedback cycles, and so we'll see in a moment how quick it is and how rapid you can sort of prototype on on um, AWS standards. And they're great as well for prototyping, um, so we'll see. So the disadvantages of serverless. Um, vendor locking is one that a lot of people are concerned with, um, and certainly there is some degree of vendor locking when you start looking at lambdas. Um, you know, they, they, they all work in their own, own little ways, but there are frameworks out there to help that, which we'll go through at the moment, um, but it, it's definitely something to be aware of. The starting latency we spoke about already, um, some languages are better than others. If you're using a dynamic language like um, JavaScript, that initial runtime cost of running like a node app is, is, is instant versus um, something a bit more full feature like the, the JVM or you know, C Sharp, for instance, where you've got that initial start of time um, of the, the runtime or the, the sort of ASP.NET, for instance. <laughs> um, it can be costly at times as well. There was an interesting story, story just recently, um, a blog post that somebody wrote how they, uh, their Lambda got stuck and in, or it was uh, something invoking the lambda got stuck in an infinite loop. Um, they forgot to return this this loop they were running, and essentially by the end of the month they've got an alert saying, "Look, you know, you spent a lot of money here." <laughs> and he logged in, and he, yeah, it was I, it was because of how cheap lambdas are. They're, they're like a matter of pence, even sub pence per invocation. Um, it wasn't too much, but it was about eight hundred dollars from memory. Um, of just the price of getting stuck in this infinite loop. So those kind of things you have to take care of and think about. Um, as well, because if you're making a Lambda publicly um, accessible via uh, some type of RESTful API or some type of API, um, you, you pay the cost of using that, that gateway. Um, if the Lambda is inside of your, your VPC or has been invoked by DynamoDB, for instance, then you can cut that, that API gateway out of your your infrastructure, but if you do want that app to be publicly accessible on the web, then you do have to have API gateway in that hands own set of charges as well. Um, but again, it, it's a case of kind of looking at your business model and your, your application and sort of looking for you know, what fits with the constraints of AWS standard. Another of the disadvantages is repetition of logic across our platforms. Um, that's something some people, you know, that they've always got a bit of with. If you're building libraries and things like that, you can share that logic, but sometimes you do find yourself kind of copying and pasting a bit of code from one to the other um, because the cost of copying and pasting over versus building the library for a small, you know, small piece of work um, is it, not there. Um, and then as well, the loss of server control, even though you do use and it's great that you don't have to worry about patching your server. If you want to do any kind of performance work on another server, um, any tweaking anything sort of at the lower level, you can't do that. There's no um, VM that you can access, there's no box you can SSH into, and all of that is, is protected. Um, server state as well, no server state increases complexity. As I mentioned, so you, there's, there's no ability to store state in the, on the Lambda. Um, it gets torn down after five minutes of inactivity. So even the addition of how to think about, okay, well, I need to persist that state in Redis, for instance, uh, that introduces just complexity and violent, the fact that you've you know, introduced another component. Um, so that can be one issue. And then testing as well is another one. Testing is a little bit more difficult. Um, when it comes to testing microservices, one of the, the best approaches is to move all of your business logic outside of the, the, the Lambda function itself. It's literally the entry point is a single function. In the case of nodes, just like a JavaScript function. Um, you move it into a separate library or into a separate class or a separate function, you test at that entry point instead of the entry point of your, your land and try and block out all the HTTP context and things. Um, so there are some restrictions <coughs> around that. Providers. So even though this is a talk on AWS land, but there are a few providers out there. Um, AWS are definitely the, um, the, the biggest ones out there right now. Um, but you've got Microsoft, close behind with their um, Azure Functions. Anybody use Azure Functions? Yeah, okay. Yep, yeah, you're good, you're good. Um, <coughs> Google Cloud Platform, kind of any Google Cloud Platform elements? Like anybody use Google Cloud Platform? No, okay. 
Um, I'm quite interested in Google Cloud Platforms, the whole Kubernetes offering, but uh, it's a Anybody who's using AWS here, I'm interested. Okay, a few more hands, okay. And how many of you are using Lambdas at the moment? Okay, a few hands. Interesting, well, hopefully you can you know, maybe get some comments. So, and the next one is um, the IBM Open Risk. Um, it's interesting actually with serverless, these functions as a service, because there's, there's a bit of a movement happening in the Docker world right now where they've got this thing called open functions as a service, which I love the idea of one of the issues you have with functions um, and functions as a service is the vendor locking. When if you're using some kind of uh, orchestration system like Kubernetes, you can, and they're running Docker containers, these, these, you know, these languages are Docker containers, um, it serves a purpose that you should be able to run. You know, these, these 500 jobs in Docker containers that move the same serverless model from AWS into your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and there's some technologies and some libraries out there that have the same, same model that Lambdas do, but you can run them as Docker containers on your own infrastructure. And it's completely open source, so it takes a whole sort of model of the serverless. It allows you to just do it yourself on your own hardware. Um, so if you're running a VM, for instance, you can just have this container that you can able to spin up and then tear down afterwards. Um, it's already sold all, all those resources back to the machine it's running on. Um, so there's, there's still a lot, of, a lot of movement in this space. It's going to be really interesting to see whether something like open functions as a service actually starts to be used by companies out there, um, allowing you to you know, easily take your, your function from one vendor to another. So this talk is about um, AWS Lambda. So in a moment, we'll jump into a demo um, using that. A bit about Lambdas, uh, for those of you that haven't experimented with them, I've already talked about the five minutes max execution time. First initial request fires that, that Lambda up, it remains active for five minutes, um, idle time, and then I'll be someone down afterwards. As I mentioned about the costing, it's, incred it's incredibly cheap for most things. You get your first one million requests, so that's one million invocations of your function for free. Um, there are some calculators out there where you can type in the number of invocations you imagine your, your service is going to get. Um, whether you're using an API gateway, as I said, using an API gateway in front of things, it's a little bit more expensive um, as a calculator will show you. But for those first million, every single month, completely free. Um, Amazon have a free tier, so for a year you have this free tier where you, you, know, you, you won't be charged for it. But even after that free tier expires, uh, you still can use those, those one million requests <laughs> each month. So you can see if you've got a service which gets called every now and again, you can quickly see how cheap uh, lambdas can potentially be because you don't have to, um, to you don't have to create a VM and look after a VM which costs you, know, costs money. Um, you pay for execution rapid to the nearest 100 milliseconds so if you have a long running process it takes I don't know, like three minutes and you pay also for that additional time if it's a small if that kind of encourages you to, if anything along with one million requests it encourages you to to build smaller lambdas as well because if you can keep it under that 100 milliseconds you know, it's incredibly cheap. Um, if you start to go into the four or five minutes, then you know it gets a bit more expensive. Um, on demand scaling, we've already talked about. If you just have the sudden influx of requests, say a whole lot of data uh, persistent to um, DynamoDB, um, it's able to instantly or almost instantly scale out um, your your lambdas and cope with that load. Um, if you're Using anything like Kinesis, so there's something called Kinesis, which is almost like messaging. If you have a sudden influx of thousands and thousands of messages, there's only so far they can scale out. So there are scaling issues at a certain, a certain length, and there are some other options around that where they sort of, in Kinesis, they start batching them to give to Lambda to handle. But for most of the things, um, there, you know, the on, on demand scaling solves a lot of problems. Um, language support, uh, at the moment we've got these four main languages, um, they are in the process of adding more. Um, uh, the most popular definitely be a node, but anybody into sort of Python, any C sharp developers here? JavaScript developers? Okay, Java developers? Okay, cool. All right, um, Python developers? Nice, okay, so Python actually. Python, I think Python is actually the most performant um, because its dynamic nature. It, 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 studies have shown, graphs show that it, you know, Python responds, responds fastest. Followed by Node and then the, the bigger sort of heavy languages like C Sharp and Java. Um, sorry? I just I, I thought Go was supported now. Okay. Yeah, so it, <clears throat> it is not really, no. So AWS don't provide support for Go, but the way those frameworks work is they run 
Python calls Go. Because one of the amazing things about Go is the fact that you can have your runtime bundled into your, oh, your really? binary. Yeah, so they actually have another language invoke your Go binary, so that it's Node or Python. And then you get really good performance from it, but mm -hmm. especially the Python one. I think the Python one calling Go is actually faster most of the time than Node. So there's there's room there to have mm -hmm. to have Go in there too. Because I was checking the same thing. I thought the same thing that supported Go when looking for it. And it was all these frameworks are essentially just Node or Python. Right. Both. Yeah. Um, so Lambda's introduced an interesting question around your your language considerations. Um, because of these initial startup costs, um, keeping Lambda's warm, these, function, these, these functions are very simple. They should be very small, very simple. The benefits you get from statically typed language, the, the benefits are usually across a large code base when you need to lean on the static type analysis there to inform you of errors. If you're creating really, really small functions, that value of having a static language diminishes somewhat because you don't have to lean on the compiler so much to tell you about these, you know, these, these type issues. So, the, the very sort of the, the, the is, is there's a far lower sort of ceiling of complexity in a function, um, which means that sometimes it is you know it is worth just going for a node uh, or some dynamic language where you don't necessarily require that type of safety. Um, ultimately, it's there are benefits using exactly type languages if you have a lot of internal code and these internal libraries that you want to run and use in your lambdas. Um, then you get that benefit of, of using the same exactly type language. But there is, there's kind of like a reduced value of having a exactly type language in your Lambda and how to face that startup cost. But for the .NET developers here, with um, .NET Core 2.0, they've done a massive amount of performance improvement on the initial upfront cost of running, um, say like an API web API, where they, they pre-jit the, the, the ASP.NET in the, in, the, in the DLLs, which means that um, you, you have, I think it's like 0.8 seconds for the very first request, it's crazy, crazy fast. It's gonna be really interesting to see when Lambda support on Core 2.0, what that does for the startup, startup time. But it is, it's worth thinking about nonetheless, a .NET developer, but you know, I end up writing Lambda's in, in Node, which is so easy. Um, enough talking, I'll, um, I love the slide. I think those of you that attended my talk last year, um, I used the same slide, I used the time time again, so great. <laughs> yeah, we'll jump into a little code map to what's involved. Oh, I just chilled out watching it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me figure out, I've got two screens here, so it gets a bit tricky. Uh, where's which, which line is this? <laughs> so, if you were to log into um, AWS, am I still logged in? Yeah, yeah, if you were to log into AWS, you go into your services up here, you go into Lambda. So, one of the ways you can create functions really, really easy via their. How are we doing on time? Plenty of time. Um, one of the ways you can do it is via their console, um, which isn't ideal because if you're running a, if you're building a Lambda, you're building it locally, um, this requires you to zip it up and then upload it via the console, which, you know, in the DevOps world, it's not very really DevOps, is it? But, you know, it's, it's a nice way to get introduced to, to the, the concept so you can all go home with all your Lambda knowledge and be like, yeah, let's go do it. Um, so here we go. So this is our triggers or our events we want to, we want to call our, you know, invoke our Lambda function from. So we want it to be publicly accessible because it's nice and easy to call them. We can just call it straight from our browser or from Postman. So in this instance, you'd go with API Gateway and what it would do is it provision that API Gateway component for you and stand that up alongside your Lambda. Um, you enter your API name, your stage, so production or you can have development. Um, your security groups as well, you won't worry about that. Um, and then essentially you, you, you enter your function name. So in this instance, it would be handler. Um, and then a bit of description, which you can you can you know use to give yourself an idea as to what the lambda actually does. And these are the different languages you can support, or uh, well, they, they support. So you can actually write your lambda straight into the AWS console. Um, yeah, it's, it's not ideal really because you, you want sort of your version control, but it gives you an idea as to how easy it can be. Or you can upload them to zip files, via zip files, or even put it in S3 itself, and then it will it'll recognize a new one has been uploaded. So if you have some kind of deployment pipeline, you can just build that into your continuous integration, um, continuous deployment approach by moving your, having your, your, your CD server, upload that file into S3 and then it'll create your, your Lambda from there. But it is as simple as that. You then go on to next and it provisions your, your Lambda and your API gateway. 
Um, there's, even though that's, that's one option, there are better options. If I go back to my slides quickly, we'll look at some of the other options um, around frameworks. And this is where they've become especially um, popular. <coughs> so there are frameworks out there that do a lot of the hard work for you. Um, the most popular one is serverless. Um, there are a few other ones, Spartan, these go, um, Zappa as well, I'm not too sure, but serverless is, is an actual business as well. It's a, a well-established business around servers. It's completely free to use, but they offer some, you know, some packages out there that, that you know, suit a bit more sort of tailored towards businesses. Um, but at Just Eat, we use servers, it's all completely free, and it, it's absolutely fantastic as we'll, we'll go through now. Um, serverless is a node. Package so ultimately it's just going to the npm install servers um, and then you log in, you create your lambda there. So you've got service create templates, hello world, um, service deploy, and that's it. You know that's as simple as deploying your lambda can get. And then you can invoke it directly via a browser or via service itself. Um, the toolkit is all focused around deploying and maintaining um, your your lambdas. Um, it supports all the cloud providers, which is great. So it means that you can easily, you can make it easier to take your AWS Lambda and move it into Azure. Um, and the way it does that is because these cloud providers have, um, how much time do I have the full hour? You will. Um, I have to ask how much time for questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'll, yeah, I'll, we'll jump to some I'll go through these bits in a moment. Um, and then it's also got a, the CLI is perfect for your deployment and integration pipelines as well. <clears throat> so if we go through Lambda now, uh, let's go through serverless now, you'll probably get a, a better appreciation as to how easy it is over having to manually log into the, um, the console. So there's going to be a code demo, and hopefully it's not the tech gods going to be on my side, but we'll see. <clears throat> I share this window, where's my curse gone? Oh, it's like Inception. Hold on, I'm trying to find my cursor on my other screen. Which way is it, right or left? There we go. Where do I go with that? Exit full screen. I'm trying to get my console across this other window now. Anybody ever done Google? There we go. Everybody see that in the back? Yep. Yeah, cool, okay. Um, so we've installed serverless, npm um, install serverless dash global, um, and then you have your, your serverless command line. Um, you've also got, so you've got serverless or you've got SLS, makes it even easier. So in this instance, um, what we'll do is we'll create our Lambda, so we would do a serverless, serverless, create, and then we specify our template. So if we go to template, and then in this instance, we're going to use um, Node.js. Um, if it were a C-sharp -sharp application, it would be AWS dash C-sharp, and it would have essentially like a function in it, exactly the same as Node, but in this instance, because we're pushed on time, um, and because it's a, a, a less friction, then we'll, we'll go with, with Node. Um, and then we can set a path, so we can say, um, hello world. And at this point now, it's creating a serverless template for us. Now, if we were to go into our Hello World folder and open this up in Visual Studio Code. Anybody use Visual Studio Code here? Yeah. Anybody not using Visual Studio Code? <laughs> yeah. Everyone else? Yeah. yeah. No, what's up? VS definitely try out VS Code. Any Sublime users? <laughs> no Power Plus Plus? <laughs> Was everybody using that? What? What's Was everybody using? Atom. Oh, okay, Atom. You've actually asked. All right. Uh, definitely try, uh, try VS Code, absolute fantastic editor. <laughs> I'm surprised the number of hands there, VS Code. Everybody loves VS Code. So anyway, so we've got this serverless YAML file, um, which we'll go through in a moment, but ultimately our function is this. This is a function that gets invoked. <laughs> Cheers for telling me. There we go. There we are. Everybody see that at the back? Yeah, nice. So yeah, ultimately this is our, our function that gets invoked. If you're using Java, C Sharp, it would be a similar, a similar thing. It's a single function um, that gets called. You've got the event there. Now we're talking about how it's event-based. Um, you've got your event, your request context, and your callback. So at this point now, what we can do using the service framework is we can go into our service configuration. This is how we tell um, serverless and thus 
AWS, how we want to configure our infrastructure for our Lambda. So in this instance, if I go all the way down to here, what we're really only bothered about at this point is we want to stand it up on a HP endpoint. So if we go and make sure that that is in the right, oh, where was that? YAML files, you've got to make sure you're indented correctly. Let me go back. There we go. That will tell me if, it is, if it's not right. Oh, it's not, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, oh. So it's got to remain under check. Okay. It's, come on. Hey. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see. I think that's right. Um, this is a bit of a weird one. It's saying that, so the template, they've got a get which creates a user, which anybody into you know, REST and HTTP, I mean, that's really silly. So I always have to change that because I feel, feel bad. But essentially all we're doing here with serverless is we're saying, okay, this is the, the, the API we want to define, so it will set up API gateway for us as well. So at that point, all we need to do um, is run um, serverless deploy, well, we'll do SLS because it saves us a bit of time, deploy dash V for the verbose, and hopefully if, oh, there we go, here we go. Come on. VS Code is like tablet. There we go. Hey, all right, here we go. So now what's happening is serverless is um, is pushing this to AWS because we chose in our initial template when we created it AWS uh, hyphen Node.js. Um, what it does is in the serverless folder is it creates these CloudFormation templates. Now whilst it's doing this in the background, CloudFormation templates in AWS land are. Um, they're almost like a schema defining the infrastructure that you want. It's almost like infrastructure as code, where it defines this infrastructure and it tells AWS how it wants to set up um, this Lambda and the API gateway. Now, with serverless, you can take your code and you can move it from AWS Lambda to Azure to the Google Cloud Platform because they all have their own equivalent of AWS Cloud Automation. I can't remember what they're called um, in Azure. I think they're called Azure Templates or something. Arm, arm Templates. Yeah. What are they called? Arm, arm Templates. Arm Templates, there we go, thank you. Um, 10.2. Um, <laughs> yeah, time? so they essentially do the same thing. So service, all that will do is it, if you say you want to buy it on Azure, is it will create the equivalent to this for Azure, and then it will push it to the Azure API, and Azure will then spin up that infrastructure for you. Um, the only issue you would have when doing this is you'd have to think about your invocation code. So if we were to go back to this code here, this handler here um, and that method signature, this function signature, is very specific to AWS. So ideally, instead of invoking your code directly inside of this, what you'd really want to do is you want to move that into a separate class or somewhere else um, to call it from, encapsulate that somewhere else. So then you've essentially just got your, your function, your Azure function, your AWS function, or your Google Cloud function that calls that, that class or that method. But for this demo, we, we won't do that. Um, but it makes moving code from one, one platform to the other a lot easier and sort of removes that, that vendor locking issue or some of it. Um, so there we go. So now that we've got our endpoint here, create, oh, it was create, I won't change that. We can now go to this and we should hopefully get our requests. So that request then has gone through API Gateway, which has been provisioned in AWS. And if we go and refresh that, conscious of the time now, um, if we go and refresh, find lambdas. It's not even shut up in here yet. I hope that hasn't set up my, my work account. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Expected to sit in here. It's not even in there. Oh, there we go. It's gone somewhere. Maybe it's on a different account. I've got a few accounts. <coughs> Maybe it's gone into my work account. <laughs> no. I think it's gone into, anyway, I think it's gone into a different um, region. Anyway, so this is taking the HTTP request, it's going through API Gateway, which is then set up, and that API Gateway is raising that event, passing it to the Lambda. Um, and as you can see from this code, is we take the event, um, and we essentially map it to the input, which takes all of you know, the whole environment, and you can see exactly what you, you, you have to, to deal with in your, your, your method there. So you get your headers, you get any request parameters and whatnot. So earlier I mentioned about the, the feedback cycle that, that you get with Lambda. So if I were to just go ahead and delete this and just say this is like a hello, hello world. I'll just be imaginative and do tech Exeter. Um, and then 
Let me get this one right, because if not, then it won't be as impressive. Um, invoke. No, I don't want to invoke. I want to deploy. Because we've got infrastructure already built, we can actually just deploy the function changes. So we can do a hello. Is it hello world? It's hello, yeah. So, there we go. So I've now deployed that function to AWS. If I refresh this, I'm expecting a round of applause from everybody. There we go. <laughs> Standing on the shoulders of giants, really. You know, <laughs> I just typed some commands and it's all AWS doing the hard work. But that's how fast you get that feedback cycle with functions and being able to deploy them. Um, naturally, if you were to go ahead and create a... Um, so you wanted to create another handler, another function. So we could go and take our this function here, copy it. And, uh, almost at the end, and I'll take questions after. Just copy this to goodbye. Quite fitting, considering we're almost at the end. It's almost like I planned this. <laughs> goodbye, it didn't actually. Um, go into here. All we need to do is let's get rid of a lot of this craft because we don't need this. This is just all the various different options that exist for um, configuring your landers. We can take these functions, we can go down here, I'm going to have to mess around with tabs probably, um, and then we'll say goodbye, events, users, create, let's just say bye. And then once we go back to our console, we can then, in this instance, because we're changing, we're, we're changing our infrastructure, we're setting up a new function. You need to update the handler. Sorry? You need to update the handler. Handler. Did I not? Under goodbye. Yeah, goodbye? Right. Yeah, and a bit like next time. Oh, well done. <laughs> if I had a prize, I'd give that to you guys. There we go, I messed that up earlier as well. <laughs> I even have a comment here to say update the handle, but I'm going to get a rush now, so come to the end. Um, so now if we're to um, serverless deploy, serverless SLS deploy, dash V, um, unless the tab's really messed up, then now what it's doing is it's, it's essentially tearing down that existing land, that existing, that existing functionality, or updating it based on the changes, and then also redeploying or deploying the second um, lambda I've got. So now, once this is finished, they usually take a little while. I can talk about one. But when it comes to making function changes, that, that the one we did a moment ago of updating existing functions is far faster. If I were to then go back and start updating this, you get that, it, that same sort of fast feedback cycle. And as soon as this is done, there we go. So now we've got our two There we go. We've got our two functions there. So that's how fast you can start to create functions. Um, and I would say that's it, but there's one little handy um, serverless SLS invoke. You can also invoke functions. So we're to do hello dash L. Um, you can also invoke your functions directly from the command line. And they give you an idea as to how long that that um, function is running from. For so as I mentioned about pricing, if it goes over 100 milliseconds, you pay per 100 milliseconds. You can see in that instance, a simple hello was 2.12 um, 2 milliseconds, um, and that's it. That's that's everything. Um, I've got a question slide here, but instead of Warren, oh there we go, question perfect. Um, yeah, that's everything. So hopefully. This talk has given you a good idea as to what um, AWS Lambda is and the benefits you can bring your, your architecture and your, your systems. Um, I hope I've kept some of you awake. So I try my best. But it's always tough being the last talk of the day. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, then I would be happy to answer some. Um, so I've got a specific use case in mind. Um, and looking at Lambda maybe nine months ago, um, there seem to be a lot of um, restrictions on things like temp, writing to temporary directories yeah. and stuff like this. Um, uh, what are the restrictions around that? The five minute execution time. So essentially what I'm wanting to do is a, a job that is quite memory intensive and builds up a, a, a large PDF. Um, but it's, it's called so infrequently that having a large kind of instance running to handle that yeah. is it's, it's, it's massively expensive, massively overkill. Yeah. And this thing kind of runs maybe a couple of times a day at most. Um, so, but it's quite memory intensive, yeah. and it needs it outputs kind of large PDF files. Yeah. Um, so Lambda was the thing I was kind of going to, but it seemed like there was quite a lot of restrictions and things like the memory that's available and that kind of thing. What's, so, what are where are the limits? Yeah. So. For, I mean, for your particular use case, have we never run into a need to do that? To be yeah. fair, I've, I've never done anything like that. But um, 
Lambda, that doesn't mean I can't answer your question. Lambda, calculate. Uh, I'm just only because they've got um, some of these calculators have um, an idea as to the, the amount of memory. So you can choose the amount of memory allocated to your Lambda. I don't know whether this has changed since you last looked right. at it, but it does go up to <coughs> one and a half gigs. Right. Naturally, that does increase the cost of running your Lambda, so yeah. you probably want to jump in the calculator and find out to see what that is. Um, but if you're doing sort of a lot of in memory stuff like building yeah, you know, yes, a PDF, yes. yeah. then I don't I don't know what the state lambda was when you looked at it, but yeah, it was the same. Yeah. It, was, it was still one and a half yeah, gigs. Was, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, you need more than that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, in that instance, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't I don't know how lambda whether lambda would be the best option if you do have to. No. Yeah. I was just wondering also whether as your Google Cloud had these kind of restrictions. Um, Maybe that's a question for other people. Yeah, um, <coughs> that kind of um, <coughs> yeah, that use case where you're you're doing a large job but it's so infrequent. Yeah, um, like, I don't know. There are, so AWS offer things like spot instances, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one as to whether that's the right fit for Lambda given the you know the, the memory constraints we talk about. I don't, I can't, I can't say about the other ones. I'm afraid I definitely recommend going to to check it out. But yeah, there are certainly some constraints around that make it difficult for certain, especially for big load jobs like that. Um, so yeah, I don't have an answer for you no, in that regard. I do apologise. Okay. Any other any other questions? In some ways, the technology is one step up. Container on demand. Is there any activity in the space for that kind of use case? Container on demand. Yeah. So, in other words, rather than having here, you're deploying a function yeah. to a small set of predefined containers, in effect. It's, it's but really, aren't you in effect? It's a yeah. small set of predefined containers yeah, provided by the lambdas. Pardon me? Across multiple lambdas, essentially. Like each container would be like a, the same. I mean, you know, like whatever the Python container is or the C sharp container or yeah. whatever, but they're predefined by AWS. Yes. But in effect, what the infrastructure is, is it's a container on demand service. Yes. Is there any activity, have you seen any activity where any of these vendors are thinking about that as a model for a service, container on demand, as, a, yes. as opposed to EC2, which is VMs in yeah. effect? Yeah, it's the concept question. of a container on demand where you would provide, instead of providing a function, yeah. you would provide a container in effect. Yeah. But then that container would be run on demand. Yes, I suppose the issue you would have with that is it's a good question. It's an interesting, it's an interesting idea. One of the issues I imagine from a cloud vendor's approach is they would know how they would need to know how to invoke that function if you were trying to talk to it. You know, if you start up your container, but if you want to pipe an event into that, I suppose that would be one technical hmm. problem. But I haven't. No, as I said about open functions as a service. Um, I'm interested to see where that goes, where they are essentially taking the functions and service model and putting them in containers that you can deploy in any environment. And I could see that turning into that type of model because at the moment they are very specific to vendors. Mm -hmm. and I don't know whether those vendors like the idea of having some commoditized functions as a service where you can you know, literally take your container from one and move it to the other. But I've not seen any movement from any of the major providers, but Open function as a service seems like that that would be the direction to go, but that's still in its infancy. AWS Lambda um, and service is still in its infancy. There's still tooling coming out around it that AWS are building and some of the other providers are building. So it's not to say it won't happen, but I've certainly not seen anything around that. But it seems like the next the next evolution of it, certainly. I mean, how how's that different though than just uh, the Lambda, sorry, the AWS container engine? Yes. yes. That's elastic containers. Well, oh, there you go. See, that's me yeah. being completely ignorant. But the, 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 problem, the problem with that, with the, the Lambda solves, is that you have to have that um, cluster running all the time to deploy. Yeah, you can say that's one, one container, then it can scale. True. I, I recognise. It's nearly five o'clock. I've been told that we need to be saying that we're So ECS would be the. Yeah. 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 I'm sure um, <laughs> Joseph will be very happy to take the discussion offline and yeah, finish answering now. all your questions. Yeah, no and thank you very much, Joseph. That's great. No